Battle Line Podcast, Ian Scotto here. And yes, it's just myself hosting this episode. This has been a very busy month for Chris Peranto doing a lot of speaking engagements. Uh, and that's just the way it goes sometimes. So this uh, interview this week, you know, I truthfully always kind of pump it up. and But I, I, I'm always being genuine. I'm like, we got a great interview for you that you guys are going to learn a lot from and love. Um, I'm going to keep it real. I And, you know... I'm always going to release episodes no matter how they go down, and, and more times than not, I'm very happy with how they go down. Uh, I get the feeling Miles Lugosi is not like the most thrilled about doing interviews. I, I, I already knew going into the interview that he does not feel the most highly of his time in the military, not for him, and not to put words in his mouth, not for himself, but I think he looks at uh, our time spent in Afghanistan as, as very negative, as well as time in Iraq, time in combat. Uh, post 9-11 and some of the stuff that he saw in the Marines uh, that he documented in Obscura, in Combat Obscura, I think he sees as just very negative and there's no positive to it. And he expresses that in this interview. Um, but keeping it real here, I I get the feeling he's not really into doing these interviews. And I'm always into having anyone on, no matter what perspective they come from, whether uh, they love their time in the military and wish they could be back or the people who hated their time in the military. I mean, prior to uh, us starting battle line on, on soft rep, I interviewed Michael Bahena who served time in Fort Leavenworth. And he definitively said, yeah, I wish I would have never joined the military, but I nonetheless got a great interview out of uh, first Lieutenant Michael Bahena. I, I'm going to keep it real. I don't, I don't totally feel the same way about this because I think he was just waiting for this interview to be over. I don't know if he had preconceived notions going in here that I'm I'm very um, hero worship of military guys, which I wouldn't say that I am. I think we keep it real on here. And I think he keeps it real in his book and, and what he said. I just get the feeling he's not thrilled to be going on podcasts and speaking about this stuff. And you, got, you guys will be the judge. It's uh, interesting nonetheless. Some of you may want to pick up the book. Some of you may... Fully, very much disagree with some of the things he says, but I always like to have people on here to speak their piece. And uh, I don't know if he was looking for me to be combative of that, but uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. Before we get into it, though, as always, Bub's Naturals is a sponsor of this podcast. Love Bub's Naturals. Uh, I got a shipment recently of MCT oil powder, collagen protein. But the apple cider vinegar gummies with the mother, some of some of those that you'll find on the shelves at other places, do not have that. And with the mother and all that, it is like a perfect cleansing supplement. If you read about body cleansing, way back in the day, I worked for a vitamin call center. And that's when I learned about colon cleansing and heavy metal detox. And I know if you go online, there's people who say that that is pseudoscience. And uh, until you've done it, I, I could say it really works wonders. Yes, if you want to... Um, maintain a healthy weight. You have to, of course, exercise, have the right diet, and you're going to lose a lot of water weight through cleansing supplements, but you're also going to get a lot of those um, toxins out of your body, which are keeping you sluggish and making you tired. And I've experienced it. And after you take those apple cider vinegar gummies with the mother from Bub's Naturals, you'll be like, wow, I'm re-energized, I'm refocused. And it's a supplement that you're going to love, but don't overdo it or else you're going to be in the bathroom. I'm pointing to where my bathroom is. You're going to be in the bathroom uh, like all day long. So don't overdo it. It's two a day and that's it. Cut it off at that. Uh, but check out all their stuff. They also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. With every purchase, 10% of all profits go to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, which helps out veterans, helps out the children of veterans uh, who are getting education. Uh, we talk about that a lot on our episode with Sean Lake. So that's bubsnaturals.com. Use the promo code BATTLELINE for 20% off. bubsnaturals.com, promo code BATTLELINE. City to New York City, 
From planet Earth to extraterrestrial life in space, a podcast with no equal, engaged in unconventional warfare through your speakers and headphones. This is a show about embracing the suck, conquering your demons, and finding God in the face of adversity. Chris Tonto Peranto. Switch is on. Mother I'm going to shoot you in the face. Ian Scotto. You know, Ian and I have been dating for a long time. You are now tuned into the Battle Line Podcast. The Switch is on, Battleline podcast, Miles Lugosi on for the first time, Marine Corps combat cameraman, uh, veteran, director of the documentary Combat Obscura. And actually, the day that we're recording this, it'll be long, you know, out a week by the time people hear this. But the day that we're recording this, Whistles from the Graveyard, is out today from Simon & Schuster. And actually, Simon & Schuster, man, they are just, they they deliver when it comes to great books, uh, military books thrillers like they just have a great lineup of authors i feel like i mean yeah they got uh stephen king they got tim o'brien they got they got all the big guns they got yeah, but then they, they've got like brad thor with the thriller genre sure they got a lot of bad authors too <laughs> and now david's gonna hear this and be like man why do you gotta point out that we have bad authors I'm not here to promote Simon and Schuster. <laughs> I I love Simon and Schuster. No, we'll promote uh, your stuff, of course. Which actually, so, they've been owned. I think they're owned by Paramount now, so it's not even, you know. Yeah, I believe so. I believe I, I'd have to. Is that for sure? They're owned by Paramount. I think they just got they got bought by Paramount, and now they're owned by an equity group. That's another thing. Okay. Well, I mean, they picked up your book though, which is pretty cool. Uh, I'll give him that. So, yeah, getting into everything, your book, actually, I will say, it, and and your documentary is very different than a lot of the people that we've had on. I mean, I always say on this show that the military is definitely not a monolith. People come from all different walks of life, people of all different perspectives on things. And the stuff that you've put out there is really just kind of highlighting the brutality of what you see when you go to war. And it's just the perspective of someone Get, getting thrown into this and seeing what it's like. And and that's why some of the stuff that you put out there in the documentary and all that has been pretty controversial. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the problem is, I think, I don't know what kind of guys you have. I don't see the show, but I'm assuming it's soft rep, right? I used to work for soft rep I, I, uh, several years ago. So the, these guys are having on are mostly special forces guys. Many, many times, but we're honestly all over the place. I mean, we'll have anyone on who's doing something interesting in the community, and th and that's kind of what we do. Okay, well, yeah. I mean, my 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 only experience uh, was with uh, the infantry. Uh, you know, where we had to live in the same place for several months, and. Our experience with special forces was mostly negative. You know, they would come in and they would get fucked up. They would they would fly in on their helos, get shot the fuck up, stir the pot, and then we'd have to clean up the mess afterwards. I mean, it's it's bit you know a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of my experience with uh, special forces has not been good. And, and special operations as a whole, you feel like Army Rangers, Navy SEALs, MARSOC, all of them? Yeah. Well, not Army. The, uh, yeah, not Rangers necessarily because they're not really special forces. I'm talking about the guys that uh, don't have to shave, you know, kind of just do, it, do whatever they want and uh, feel like they understand what the fuck they're doing and they get faulty intel and they go to some place, do a night raid, kill a bunch of fucking innocent people and then we're they leave and then we're stuck to clean up the the retaliation against that so and that you're talking about mainly in, in iraq afghanistan 
did you did because I actually wanted to make clarify that. So you you served your combat deployments were all Afghanistan. Correct. Okay. I was actually wasn't sure if you served in, in both places. Okay. So g- getting into, I know first, you know, you put out the documentary and a lot of the stuff that you put out there, people are, you know, uh, sort of the way that it was marketed out was they were saying, this is the movie that the Marine Corps does not want you to see type of thing. Uh, like, how did you feel about the pushback of what you were putting out there of people saying like, maybe the public doesn't need to see just how bad the brutality of war can get? I think it's bullshit. I think any veteran that says uh, people do not deserve to see the truth, that cannot, the this idea that they cannot handle the truth, Jack Nicholson, right? The sure. kind of Jack Nicholson uh, mentality and uh, uh, whatever it's called, two good men. Um, this whole mentality of war is hell. Don't ask questions. Just say thank you for your service. Don't be critical of the military. Don't be critical of the troops. I think it's bullshit. I think that's what uh, perpetuates the same endless wars because no one is talking critically to to veterans, especially to each other, about uh, what what actually is happening. And so you get these false accounts. I mean, these really, really atrocious, like Marcus, you know, lone survivor kind of like tapping himself on the back kind of shit making up uh, the number of Taliban fighters that they were up against. You know, I think in the book he said 200. In real life, it was seven guys. It was a video. I mean, the, Tal- the Taliban was videotaping it. It was seven guys who overtook their squad of four guys. And yeah, no, I, I know about that because I've, I've actually, like, Leo Jenkins, who we've had on the show, was part of Operation Red Wings, and I know there's been a lot of controversy over that type of thing. Well, I got a serious problem with uh, with him trying to make a Marvel action figure out of himself in his fucking book and then that getting turned into a movie. And then people, that's their, that's how they understand the war, right? Sure. As some kind of Marvel action movie, which it's not. So, you know what I was actually wondering, like in, in your book itself, you're brutally honest with your upbringing and, and you say, you know, like I, I was a screw up and... and I didn't know what I wanted to do out of high school and that type of thing. Did you did you aspire to join the military? Because I know you say, like, I didn't want to go to college. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I aspired not to be homeless. I aspired. <laughs> I aspired not to uh, rob banks. Uh, I, I, I wanted to get the shake out of me, which is a lot of. Um, a lot of kids that joined the military, especially during uh, Obama's troop surge wanted to see action and that and there's uh, people say 9-11 i mean you know that stuff to me is secondary the main reason kids join especially the marine corps infantry is because they want to go down range and you and you would say that for you you were in that same demographic you wanted to go to war you wanted to see combat right but i wanted to film it i didn't want it to kill anyone so, but were you a photographer prior to joining the military? I was 18. So, I mean, you know, I took like a journalism class in high school. That was it. But you didn't, did you shoot photography just like at, recreationally, that type of thing? Just skateboard stuff, like if we were skating, stuff like that. Got you. I so then when, when you got thrown into combat, combat photographer, you saw all the stuff that's in Combat Obscura. What was there some point where it was a turning point of wow, like this is not what I expected to see? Yeah, the first day. Do you want to get into that a little bit? Uh, we took over a compound, and uh, there was, um, you know, basically how it worked was we would we would roll in and we'd take over a mud hut, someone an Afghan family's house. We'd pay him to leave, and then we would take over the house and make it our base. And uh, there was a litter of kittens in uh, one of the haystacks in one of the rooms. And uh, they wanted to, me to film them hitting one of them with a shovel. So that was my first realization that, okay, the camera is actually, in, like, if I wasn't there, would they have done that? Would they have wanted to do that? 
You know what I mean? Yeah. So do you, do you think that this was like some kind of egging on of bad behavior and that type of thing? Because I think a lot of people see you know, like Fahrenheit 9-11, for example, we saw some crazy shit in there or even like the videos that went viral of I, I don't remember who it was in the military, like what branch, but throwing that dog off the cliff. Um, the the I'll like grab the yeah all all of that so district, yeah so do you blame you know social media like the 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 more you I know think that we have with different... cameras for this type of I behavior think, I think uh, I think it, there there is a new era of soldier you know the internet soldier and I think yes I think it does have an impact yeah the camera plays a huge part which is ironic because the camera was first developed as a weapon of surveillance, you know, during, um, uh, you know, whatever it was, World War One, cameras were basically used as weapons. And in a way, they're still kind of uh, a tool of almost like a feedback loop, right, of behavior, of soldiers wanting to see themselves in action, wanting to get into some shit, you know, having the camera on you, that type of thing. There's definitely a performative aspect to it. All right, guys, before we continue this interview with Miles Lugosi, as always, this show is sponsored by Fort Scott Munitions. Fort Scott is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition. It's designed to tumble upon impact and soft tissue, leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military-grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states. Just go to the dealer locator, but you're going to get the best deal through us when you go to fsm.com and you use the exclusive promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order. Only available to listeners of the BATTLELINE podcast. They have the best ammo out there. Check them out. So many of our listeners have switched over to them and they love what they do and they're a company that we truly stand behind. Great family and uh, great products. So Fort Scott Munitions, once again, fsm.com, promo code BATTLELINE. Once again, proud supporter of Chris Peranto, BATTLELINE Tactical, and the BATTLELINE Podcast. And of course, if you haven't already checked out our recent Night Vision episode, we talk all about Photonist Defense. If you're thinking of making the investment in the best night vision out there, uh, that episode is probably going to put you over the top and make you say, I got to check them out. Yes, I know it's a big investment, but if you're going to get the best night vision, you got to make that investment. So now you can have the superpower to see in the dark with the Viper Binocular Night Vision System by Photonist Defense, which is the global leader in night vision solutions, providing more high quality night vision capabilities than anyone. Military, law enforcement, and public safety end users utilize Photonist Defense Solutions to give them the edge at night in tactical situations and rescue operations. Hunters, shooters, boaters, and enthusiasts can rely on the Photonist Defense Viper Binocular to become masters of darkness. The new Viper Binocular system carries the same features and benefits as the Photonist Defense Viper Monocular, with a ruggedized body and harnesses the power of the echo intensifier tubes, giving you sharper images, reduced halo, and industry leading ultra fast auto gating across the range of dynamic operating conditions. Go to photonistdefense.com for more information or look for Photonist Defense product options from your night vision dealer, P H O T O N I S Defense. Dot com And once again, check out that past episode with the guys from Photonus Defense just a couple episodes ago. Uh, really enjoyed having those guys in the studio. And with that, let's get back to this episode. And do you think, like, did the guys that you served with, did, did they like the fact that you were taking video of everything, that you were photographing everything? Yes. There were some, there were some guys who didn't, but... Uh... The, there were most of the guys really liked it yeah 
what about when the movie actually came out and some of these I, and i don't know if you got the reactions and they and you know the public was seeing some of the stuff you're putting out there did they have second did they second guess yeah. kind of their behavior out there definitely you know why because you go to war and you sugarcoat your memories you delete certain things right like you kind of you kind of tend to think about the good stuff and not necessarily the bad stuff as much and so here I am dragging all this shit out. And uh, a sniper actually called me from the unit and said, you know, you just, you corrupted our memory. Right? Like, I have footage of a civilian that, that they killed, that they still think was, you know, a bad guy, whatever. And the footage uh, corrupts that memory. And it, and it, and it's, uh, it has a bad impact. But it also has brought together, a, you know, huge number of uh, the guys from my unit who want to see honest depictions, who are sick of the same fucking bullshit depictions. American Sniper, Hurt Locker, Lone Survivor, Black Hawk Down, all this bullshit, like, American hero nonsense. They want to see the truth. Did, did any with- of... I was just wondering, did did any of them try to keep the film from getting out there? Did any of them try to like halt the film from being screened? How? How could they? It's public no, domain. Of course, but I I mean, did any of them get in touch with you and say like, "Hey, this the is embarrassing. Marine? I don't want this no. out there." The Naval Criminal Investigative Service did the Marine. Corps no, did. that I know the like people up top, but I mean, guys you served with. Did any of them no. say like, "Fuck, no. I don't, I didn't want this out in the public"? Yes. Yeah, so- some of the faces are blurred, yeah. Most of the, most of the faces that are blurred, though, are the Afghan translators because their life is actually at risk. I could give two fucks about a guy smoking weed in the field in Afghanistan who now works at fucking Walgreens. I don't give a shit about him. I care about the Afghan translator who's who's going to get beheaded if his face is seen on camera. So I could give two fucks about some guy smoking hash. I mean, I'm sure. on camera smoking hash. I'm the one behind the camera most of the time filming all this shit. Uh, that to me means nothing. Uh, what what I'm most concerned is about the Afghans. Yeah. When when you hear about the the rise we see in veteran suicide and that type of thing, all this stuff going on, you know, post traumatic stress. Do you think a lot of it is related to this type of stuff that you've gotten footage of, where guys feel a tremendous amount of guilt over things that they wish they would have done differently or any of that? I mean, you're, you're, I guess, disagreeing as I'm saying it, but I, yeah, I'd like to get your opinion on that. I would, I would hope so. Yeah, I would hope so. Uh, I think, um, like I said, most of the depictions that have come out, like American Sniper, I think his, his, they, uh, Clint Eastwood put his, and uh, remember, remember, uh, remember, American Sniper was one of the high, I think it was the highest grossing post 9 11 war film, right? It was nominated for the best picture at the Oscars, et cetera. Um, his, the main character's PTSD or guilt seemed to come from the fact that he had not killed enough Iraqis or Afghans. He's like, oh, damn, I should have killed more of them, so I, should, I could have saved more Marines' lives, uh, which is total nonsense. Um, I, I guarantee you the number of, of, of civilians that Chris Kyle killed with that mindset uh, is, is in the hundreds. He claims to have killed 100 uh, Iraqi or Al-Qaeda fighters. He doesn't know who he killed. He doesn't fucking know. There's people, wa- there's people in drones, there's people in blimps, you know, watching the people day and night. They don't know who's bad. They don't know who's good. You know, it's like it's like having a fucking drone in Washington Heights and up, and, you know, in uptown New York shooting low level drug dealers who you don't even know. You don't know the language they speak. You don't know the culture. And so. The main like the biggest depiction we have is of a guy who is ashamed of not killing more Iraqis. That's the best we got. Do you think on some on some level though that that's just like machismo that that's just bravado? Yeah, but that's the problem. Sure. I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying, because I think that, yeah, um, the American public does sometimes eat up that type of stuff. And that's why I said, like, when we went into this interview, that the military is not a monolith. Like, we have all different types of people on, whether it's special operations or guys like yourself, who are going to have very different recollections of what they saw in the military, what they saw in combat and their reflections on their time spent overseas. And, and that's why, like, as we, and they have selective recollection as well. Selective depending on who, do you, well, would you say that you have selective? I mean, no. you have uh, it all on video, so. Yeah, exactly. But do you, but you, you would say, I mean, I don't think all of the guys we've had on, I, I would put in that category, because I think we've had guys that are very brutally honest about their time, whether it's the positives and negatives. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can be, my cat i can be uh what do you want to hear about the positives of a 20 year long war that had no purpose what's the positive and that uh, i understandable from your perspective no, no, i mean, i want to hear one positive well i could tell you that we've had on a guy named hamity jassim who um was who, who was an iraqi who worked with the american um military over there joined the and he was um put into jail as a young boy, if you listen back to that episode, just because he had money in his pocket, was put into Saddam's prison. And he agrees with the fact of America invading Iraq, which many guys are going to disagree with. I understand his perspective, though, growing up in Iraq and being tortured in a prison as a young kid. So I would say that's a positive coming from ain't his that perspective. The worst ain't that the worst part, though? Ain't that the worst part? Like we make friends, we give them hope. And then it's gone. It's always gone. We give them some kind. We make friends with them, right? I wouldn't and say it makes, is for him, though, because he's now an American. He's now, like, living his best life over here, you know? Well, I couldn't hear you. What? You no, I was saying for him, like, for his per, per, for his particular um, case, I don't think I would say that about him because he's now living in America and he's now, like, doing his own podcast, like, doing inspirational speeches, and, like, it ended up being a positive story. For him, I mean, for, just as one example, him, yeah. many. How many? How many people though had to die in the process? Yeah, you'd have you'd have to speak for him. I obviously can't speak for him, but I'm just I'm giving one example. Him. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna speak for him. Sure. No, and I'm saying neither can I. Um. So well, I, I'm getting the um impression, and I've had many people on where we asked this, and I think there's maybe been one or two in the history of me doing um not even just this show, when I was previously with Safra, of guys who would say they regret joining the military. By and large, I don't hear that. Like, the one guy that I could remember was Michael Behenna, who was serving time in Fort Leavenworth, was eventually, his sentence was commuted by Trump, and he did say emphatically, like, yeah, I wish I would have never joined. Do, uh, would you say that's your, your perspective? I mean, that's what I'm getting from speaking with you. I don't believe in... Uh regret i believe in guilt i have a lot of guilt for what i did if i regretted if i changed what i did in the past i wouldn't be who i am today i wouldn't know the truth that i know the truth today and um so i don't believe in that in changing the past or regret i do believe in guilt and i and i have a lot of guilt and i think most i think veterans that are actually honest with themselves and not on Joe Rogan fucking bragging about how many fucking people they killed or who they got their first kill with, that kind of shit. I don't think they're being honest with themselves. You know? I think it's the same uh, the same brainwash training, same machismo sh shit that you just talked about, uh, same American exceptionalism, uh, same fear-mongering about terrorism that we're seeing right now in israel uh same it's the same shit different you, was was the book therapeutic for you in some way of of those issues oh, yeah. yeah for for sure yeah do you I want mean, to like movie, expand on that a little bit the, or the, I, the movie like the movie i know that there's no movie like combat obscura that it that, that is actually uh, that honest, right? And 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 without context, like you're being dropped in to the shit, and you don't know what the fuck is going on. So I think the movie was cathartic in a different way, more as like 
a, a, like a statement. Like the book is a, was a story that I had to craft and make care. You, you make characters out of real people, even yourself, you know? And uh, so that was therapeutic in a different way. Yeah. Did, but at did the end you... of the day, at the end of the day, it's not about my therapy. It's about, you know, just wanting, uh, wanting to be like realistic depictions because, it's so far few in between, you know? Sure. Did you seek out any other therapy or like, was, was there anything else you worked on for yourself to get through the things that, that you saw and that you documented? Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. What type of stuff? What kind of therapy? I mean, that's kind of personal. I'm, you know, no, I got you. I mean, we've had guys on the show though, who, who are into like extreme sports. They've done, you know, snowboarding. They've done just other things that have, help them out through the process no just regular therapy talking okay yeah well the book as i said is out today if people want to check it out which is whistles from the graveyard you're not on any uh social media or anything from what i've seen right no so what do you want you know last thing i'm wondering what do you want people to get out of what this do you book? Want? what do you want <laughs> what's up what do you want from this book uh i would like people to um get a good fucking story and a good read. And uh, to me, the main purpose of books, like when I read uh, Tim O'Brien's The Things That Carried, I related to that even though it was a different war. And I was able to feel, I was able to heal through that, through that book. And I was able to feel less insane, I guess, through the, through the connection with the author. And that's all, that's all you can really hope for. All right, man. Well, um, it's it's been interesting having you on, and uh, best of success on the book. All right, man. That's all for this episode of Battleline Podcast. But we're always posting new content on social media. Follow us on Instagram at Battleline Podcast and on Twitter at Battleline Pod. That's an order. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes up every Tuesday. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast platform of choice. Believe in yourself. Face all challenges head on. And as always, never quit.